Hey, I wanted to start this video today uh, just uh, to honor the memory of Daniel Green. Uh, for me, a student at the arts, a teacher at the Art Students League, um, in my days there, um, I, <laughs> uh, I was a monitor of his class. I uh, wanted, you know, the the uh, thing I remember most and the thing I found most valuable about his teaching was that he was his his ability to be. Um, Analytical about the whole process, and then to be methodical, uh, and um, and that was something I'd never seen uh, up, up to that point. Of course, I hadn't seen much up to that point. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, something really important, something you see associated with Sargent, is the idea of being methodical. If you look at Rothenstein book, Rothenstein's book, Men and Memories, but um, uh, and just for whatever it's worth, I. Uh, I, I pose as a model for him uh, and show up in one of his books. So <laughs> you might see a long-haired version of me with a with a um, an army jacket <laughs> and a uh, hippie picture, you know, uh, one of those double portrait things uh, that he was doing back then. In any case, uh, my thanks and honor to Daniel Green for his uh, for his efforts in in teaching all these years and. Uh, um, and of course, for the work he's done. Uh, what I want to do starting this today, though, is he was a broken color painter, and um, let's say he, he 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 was a continuation of what Robert Brackman was showing us, which is out of the um, the Hawthorne slash Monet background, broken color, and um, and so um, greetings from the nether from Netherlands, says Zoran. Um, I was thinking in the last couple of videos, would you be able to give us some more pointers about the broken color concept? Uh, how to introduce it in your work and how to apply it to things we see. That's uh, So I, I get the part, how to introduce it into your work. In other words, how to use it. Uh, and I think of it that way, by the way. Broken color isn't, to me, a, a look that I'm trying to get. Uh, I'm not even sure it was with Monet. I'm pretty convinced it wasn't. I think he was just trying to get find a, a means to fully express the quality of light through the full spectrum color thing. So, uh, so <laughs> watch out how you uh, hear me here because I may not be answering your question in precisely the way you are, are aiming it. One of the things I remember about being a student was the incapacity to aim the question well, and it was only because I didn't know anything. <laughs> you know, I had no idea. I was just like, what, what, just say it, whatever I got. And I, um, uh, and however it comes out, and eventually you just realize there's a better question uh, in this thing. And I'm not saying, I, I just might be just taking your question, taking a hike with it. For, uh, so if you want me to answer something else, but how to introduce it into your work and how to apply it to things we see. So, yeah, <laughs> in the first part of it's an aesthetic, how to introduce it into your work. I mean, um, I'm not just watch what I tell you in the course of this few slides. And for some of you, this probably will seem overdrawn. Um, it's just about broken color. And I'm going to show you about maybe a dozen slides or so. And I, at the end, I'm going to show you uh, a broken color painting, uh, a lay in by me, and then a finished one, a, a later version of something that would be rather like that. And you can see what I do if, if, if you mean how to apply it to things we see. I mean, how do you use it in your work? Um, so, and by the way, I don't, you can talk about introducing it into your, rather say into your work, why, why don't you say how to, introducing it into your method, into your way of working, in, into your, maybe that's what you mean, um, and that's something that you're going to see the value of really quickly here, okay? So let me just uh, walk down here to um, Monet and show you what woke everybody up, and I, I love to say that about Monet, he <laughs> just, he's this guy who got another idea. He was messing around outdoors with a lot of, by the way, uh, your countrymen, uh, you know, the Boudin, Jonkind, those guys. Um, and um, and uh, and he kept moving in this direction and he kept going deeper with some other, you know, if, if you want to call that science, some other thinking about the science of color and light. The, but it was evolving out of what you see in the Boudin uh, world. And... Um, uh, you see the inklings of it in Boudin um, and uh, John Kind. Uh, and there's elements of those two guys, both, that are necessary to be able to make this. And I'm talking about the spot making, all right, to begin to open this up to us. 
But when you get to Monet, the guy is just in pure color, color value search with the idea of getting the full color value of the general impression of the world as you see it, with no thought about agendas like the story or any of those things. You see what I mean? And, uh, and you can see with what amazing uh, 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 power it's expressing a new truth. Now, isn't that an interesting idea of a, a new truth? Is there such a thing, right? And yet, it, what we're always after, what humans keep finding is a more profound truth, a better, a, more, a deeper understanding, right? And that's a, that's a nice way of refer, referring to it. So, you know, you can't pick on Titian. Uh, there's beautiful color all through the Renaissance. And, uh, but, but this level of truth that you start seeing coming out through this Monet required him to use broken color. And people have since tried to do without broken color. It does not do the same thing. Uh, and, and furthermore, there's this need for a search, right? And, and this big deal about putting the stuff out there on your canvas and finding your way through the necessities. And I say the necessities, meaning if you can only have a red this rich, how are you going to make the rest of these things be right to it? Well, you have to go out there and put it out there and then start the adjustment process, right? That's what you like about that uh, comment by Benson, right? Painting is adjusting, right? Like writers will say that, right? Writing is rewriting. Um, so let's go past this for a second. I'll bring him back in a minute. And um, so here's the thing. He says, a lot of crazy things have been written on the union of perfect color and perfect form. They'll never be united. Nor could they be united. I like that. I, we, we were sort of involved in thinking they might be. And I think that was partially as a result of what Gamble himself was doing when he was rather trying to get us to buy into the idea of some combination of the academic and the impressionist. And I think Monet comes the nearest to actually doing it. But, uh, but there is a loss on, uh, uh, on Paxton's part in the color world. And uh, what you, you'll never see anything in, in, in uh, Paxton that, 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 that has that color power of either Monet or, or Degas when Degas begins to do this, this decorative exploration with it. So there's that thought. Can they ever be united? Well, why would you want them to be? And I think he really wants to say that color to be perfect must have a contour that's floating or simple. It can never be arrested. And he goes on to talk about, you know, stained glass having, you know, not being able to sustain the kind of drawing that he does, Ang does in his own work. So you've heard that from me before. So, so here's Ang, and I'm showing you the opposite. I'll we'll start with the ideas, you know, what's the, the, the truth lies in the conflict of ideas or, you know, in its opposite. I, I, I was most amused when I was hunting for this Ang. I ran into this uh, uh, Hiroshigi, or I hate to say I probably isn't Hiroshigi, but the, the Japanese print down below, and was rather stunned by the color relation. They, look at that. <laughs> that. I mean, that is that is Ang's color. But what you're seeing in here is the, what we call local color, right? There's the gold in the guy in the foreground. There's gold. He's got a gold jacket, uh, or whatever you call it, uh, cover. The... Um, uh, Christ has a blue one, the other guy has a red one. That's pretty much what you're seeing with, um, with the Japanese one, right? With the Japanese print, uh, you know, the blue. But what's the difference between the two, of course, now you see that Ang's involved in big flat patterns in the first place with a lot of form in them. And the Dutch, I mean, I'm sorry, and the, uh, and the Japanese prints, printmakers were just as well, uh, partly because of their process. But they found the most astonishing beauty between the two of them. You know, the difference is, of course, that Ang wanted it to be patterned in form or shape and form, and form was the big deal. Whereas the, uh, with the Japanese, it was pattern, pattern, pattern. So anyway, but you're going to see that when you start shifting, <laughs> uh, uh, when you start going to what Monet's talking about, there's a, there's a need for a shift, right? And the, suddenly you, this idea of hanging on to these sharp edges and, and, and uh, 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 clear cutouts of, of objects begins to be in more doubt every, every second, right? And you can see the background of the portrait above there that, uh, that um, Ang is, uh, the, the landscape behind is all flat patterns. Uh, everything is about the shape and the color of that shape and all those sorts of things um, without being too simplistic about it. I mean, obviously, when you get down the rocks and the big picture down here, he's drawing rock after rock after rock like it's the form, it's the actual shape of the rock. And it's not a search for color or anything like that, right? The sort of that, that thing about the color has sort of been decided on. There's this general color. By the way, interestingly enough, in the broken color world of Monet, that's not different. I could go back up there for just a second. Uh, 
it's it, this this still is what you might call that same general color it's just that he happens to be leaving the mark searching the searching through for the color he's leaving the the various contrasting colors down there because of what they how they deliver something that's needed for the color for the for the light rather and that's different that's significantly different from what uh, ang is doing he's just getting the color of the of the ground so and the Boston School guys were raised rather like that. They were raised with with uh, Monet in their eyes. They were they, they were all brought up with outlines, modeled modeled uh, objects, right? Outlines modeled up. Um, you know, the, you can see the the, uh, the the color of the chair, the color of the uh, whatever. Everything is its own color, and it's and happily in its place as an object, as part of an object. Most of us still think that way today. Most students do. Uh, so again, something happened here. <laughs> I like to say on the way to the forum, something happened on the way to the forum. It was a funny line from a movie. Uh, and what it did was it caused people like Sargent even to go sit at the feet of Monet. And uh, it, literally, he's studying Monet. And of course, Monet wasn't a um, said he wasn't a teacher, but he was a he, he carried on a conversation. And he stood there and painted in front of you. But what he was doing was so electrifying that. So here you see Sargent, here you see uh, Hale, Boston School Hale, and here you see uh, uh, Joseph uh, DeCamp. I show this simply because it's got a figure in it that shows a similar amount and type of drawing as what you'll see with the Sargent in this, in this search. Uh, now you, in, the, in the Sargent, and in all the three of these, you can see the broken color, right? That's the search. This whole thing about the search is really crucial to this thing, right? The search for the note, right? So getting notes out there and then getting them right in relation to each other, color notes, all this stuff rather begins to precede the idea of drawing, right? The idea of, of object making for sure, right? And so, of course, uh, Monet is talking about trying to maintain a naive eye. But, but so you see color movements like it's greener over here and orange over here. That's what we call a color movement. And that those oranges will show up. They'll begin to be woven in. You're going to see the idea of weaving color notes. These are some of the things you can contribute I will talk about it. at the very end of this thing. I will talk about what I do. So, um, so here's here's uh, De Camp above, Tarbo below, and Paxton on the side. You can see they're all doing the same thing, right? You see the the broken color all through every area. Uh, it's necessary. Now, and the nice thing about the landscape, of course, is it's very it's given that it's rather textural. If you have grasses and and, and tree leaves and all those things, there's the, the element of texture is already taken for granted. I'm sorry, this is such a bad photo. I can't. I thought I had a better one, but it. I, Turned out not to be the case. But um, uh, anyway, you can see this search for color value. And when you're trying to get actually a texture, then you're not as careful. In fact, you're rather not careful to get the value to match on your palette. You actually don't mind. You want the color shift, but you might actually use a different, a darker version of it because it will suggest texture. And the idea of suggesting um, texture is a big, big, big deal. And in, 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 uh, broken color um, lends itself to um, to texture, to the feeling of texture. So you're not making grass anymore, but you're making um, textural shifts. If you look at the um, uh, bunker, which I don't show any of the Medfield pictures, you'll see his creation of texture through smaller and smaller brush strokes as you get further and further into the distance. But he never actually, well, I suppose in a couple of places he draws something that rather looks like grass, but mostly it's not, mostly it's suggested. And uh, the color does the biggest part of the work, and it's one of those interesting things about it. You know, uh, Ang. I send out these quote things by Ang, and they're all damning. Uh, or saying drawing is ninety-five or seventy-five percent. Uh, did I say drawing? Painting is seventy-five percent or more drawing. And and I'm showing these pictures here, where I can assure you that when I do a portrait, the uh, the thing is is seventy-five percent color. And when I get the likeness in the color, then I begin to worry about the drawing, and I've never found it comes up to 75%. I don't know a number like that. I don't think it's even a useful one, because we're really trying to do all things. And, and if you give one of them a rating thing, you're going to lose the value. Uh, you're going to start focusing on it at the expense of other things. So that's just me. Okay, so there's Starbell indoors now. He's, he's, you can see he's in all that same broken color stuff. Out here, the grasses and all those sorts of things. Um, I guess that was before the days of the great mowers. They must have uh, had a tractor go through their, through the orchard, and then it, had, it, it was growing up, and <laughs> they didn't do it a day, on a daily or weekly basis, by the look of it. Uh, but again, you can see the uh, the color movements within the trees, the search for color, the search for the color values and value relationships. And what happens is, if you hit a note right here, 
and you hit a note right here, and then you hit another one somewhere else. Eventually, these notes have to be right to each other. So, so there you are with, say, three darks, and here you have this opportunity to just adjust this one a little bit and actually make it, give it more vitality, too, by just simply breaking a new color into it to make the adjustment, right? That's a big deal about our way of working. And, of course, you can see the same thing with both of these. Uh, this is one of those things about the... Um, the subject discussion that the Ashcan School brings up uh, illicitly, rather, uh, to try to politi- as they work on politicizing painting. Um, but um, the uh, content, uh, I found a, actually, I found a really interesting uh, quote. I should have put it in here, would have been fun. I'll probably do it in the next one. But uh, talking about subject, I found an a wonderful Ann quote who says, he, he basically says the subject is nothing. He says, he said, you, you can make gold out of four cents. Uh, worth a subject. And he says you can make, and he describes his earliest stuff as being basically nothing by way of subject. It's what you do with it, right? So the biggest misunderstanding about the Boston School is, is in, is, was created by the, the uh, Ashcan people who, who say these people are just painters of privileged women in privileged settings and all this sort of stuff, you know. And, uh, and of course, the reality is they were, they were middle class guys. None of them came from money. Uh, that I in, in this group, I think none of them did. And um, and what you see, but what you see is that they actually couldn't have cared less. They just took the subject that was in front of them. These are the interiors of their homes, or the backyard, you know, the orchard in the backyard or whatever. And so what you're seeing though is the, the, the search for the music. Look at the look at the amazing stuff that's happening in here. They just never lost track that this is an optical beauty that we're after here, not a not a storyline, you know, not a political storyline especially. But anyway, so, and again, the search, it's the search, right? So, you know, the, the, the amount of greens, the type of greens and the distribution through a painting, you can only really get these adjustments if you don't make up your mind and do all this drawing in here, having said it's green X. You have to do this whole search thing through all these colors and that sort of thing. doesn't mean you couldn't actually do this and then take the whole drawing carefully made uh, and then work a different way with it, uh, you know, by just simply now gluing in these colors onto objects. You could do that. And some people have. Now here's uh, Benson. Uh, and some of his pictures really are, uh, you know, sort of electrifying in the same way as um, as uh, Monet is. Uh, his effects, his, you know, the uh, articulation of the figure, was, which some think is still understated, is still so much more uh, powerful and effective and de- evolved, I guess you'd say, than Monet's figures outdoors. Uh, but the uh, but the same old thing applies here though, and it's the, one of the big questions. You have a blue down here. Paxton's talking about it, and if you see some of it up in here, you have this opportunity to f- slip a little bit in up here if you're just doing broken color. You're not having to wait till you paint the sky. You have the note in your brush. Same thing with her hair, and the relationships to the grasses down here. And of course, the whole thing is about the beauty of the relationships, isn't it? Which so I'm saying this really gives you a vehicle for searching out the truth which is very different from thinking of it as an aesthetic. And, it, and by the way, it does have an aesthetic. There is an aesthetic element um, in the sense of the purely uh, optical, right? In other words, the, the uh, I said that, how did I say that? I meant, I meant the purely uh, painterly. The broken color world can be its own, it can have a beautiful thing going on all by itself. Uh, and should really, actually, if you're gonna leave it that way. Anyway, here he's doing it with a still life. And then uh, on with Monet. Now, what you're seeing here now is the um, is the movement out of Monet. Degas, uh, Degas referred to himself as a um, uh, as a decorator, and he and he said he was a um, uh, an impressionist in line. And um, but what he's doing here, this is imaginative painting, and he f- refers a couple times to 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 Persian rugs. I think they must have been Persian rugs. And he's talking about finding color schemes in them, but he's also talking about the weaving idea. And uh, the idea of, and again, when you have a yellow here and you, can, you pick it up here and several other places, this idea of bringing, uh, bringing um, uh, a, a, a note to the rest of the painting is one of those things that's an opportunity that you have when you do this quiet searching before you settle in on this, you know, on the drawing. And one thing I'll tell you, though, is the searching, really, the broken color especially, the more solid your drawing is, the more convincing your lines are, the less you'll do this. You won't want to break those lines. You'll want to stay in this happy, safe place. Uh, and, and you won't do the search. Color is very interesting that way. I used to refer to it like a fawn at the edge of the woods, you know. If you sit there 
and get and 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 start being dramatic with it and and let the drawing come into the room it just runs off it doesn't want any part of it i'm mixing some metaphors <laughs> but anyways but 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 here again you see the blues in through here and you see the pickup the play the movement through the the greens the blues whatever and you know, this is one of those places where I, I look at this thing and I wonder how Gamble can demote him as a colorist. In Viz, uh, for example, uh, Veronese, whose color is understandably uh, the most the most highly uh, regarded or was until you got to the Monet world happening. But uh, but this picture right here, which is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and of course reproductions don't do anything justice, and they always make it look more hyper lit, uh, which all of our work will do on on the uh, internet. Uh, but this is to me is a, just a marvel of beautiful color distribution and color choices. Um, and this one with the uh, Russian dancers. And again, the, the, he's, he's, he's definitely put lines down out there first, but he's definitely not interested in and not worrying about how well he saves them as much as he's worried about the putting the time into the color play. This is an opportunity in, a, in, in, in decorative painting to make subtle adjustments, you know, you want you suddenly realize that this thing here, when you're watching the whole, isn't golden enough. So you, instead of being just that, now all of a sudden you're moving toward the golds, and uh, or whatever else it is, and with the idea of interweaving these notes uh, throughout the entire painting. Well, those opportunities are yours, and these are both pastels. These are opportunities are yours in broken color, in this in this working stage. It's interesting that the uh, guys like Ang would do color studies, even Bougro, they would do color studies. It's sort of preparatory things, right? Well, this is rather like that. You're doing the the full, you know, because you're doing in well, not in Degas' case, but but in doing the slice of life thing, you have this moment in the sun where you can really make it its own color study, and we found very effective ways of doing that. And uh, but the need for the search for the broken color to, for the purposes of searching, but also because of the vitality of the life of the color, the, the vitality of the color, uh, uh, you you want to do it. One of the interesting guys, Arthur Spear, I put his name here because I keep forgetting it. <laughs> Arthur Spear was a Boston School fantasy painter. But I, I give you a close-up here because I want you to look at the uh, this area of the neck, chest, and even down through here, you just marvelous broken color movements. And so here he is doing this stuff with what, with, with Boston School, it was a Boston School training, with Boston School broken color. And I've I'm just completely uh, flabbergasted at how effective it is, uh, you know, with this minimal drawing and all the rest of the stuff. And this isn't even one of the better ones. Some of them are quite amazing things. Nymphs and satyrs and underwater creatures and all sorts of stuff. He's a delight. Uh, not much online. I don't know where to find anything by him, so good luck hunting. But he's, uh, but he's worth your hunt, if your search. Uh, I've, I've made explorations in this direction with imaginative uh, uh, work with imaginative uh, pictures, you know, in broken color, and I w didn't amuse me like it obviously does him. What to God does amuses me a great deal more. So I'm going to take you back for a second, just for a second, to um, because I want to show you uh, the difference in how this what this is providing for us, um, and how I I use it actually, um, uh, Zoran. But this is that same. Uh, um, I'm sorry, this isn't the same. I didn't show this earlier, did I? This is the this is the this is an ang, right? And I've shown these before, or this one side by side with some other decamps. But this is a decamp, which, if you see it in the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, from the point of view of 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 color and color and light in an indoor picture, I don't know if I've ever seen anything as stupendous as this thing right here. Now, this is this this is not to take anything away from the beauty of the color scheme here, and the beauty of of. of of the picture as a whole, I mean, it's just it's 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 you know, and I haven't seen it in person, but every every single shot I see of it suggests to me this is really a, a marvelous picture. But this this other truth now, and he's all about truth, right? But his truth was about the truth of the form, and uh, and, and it was his big conversation of the form and form and line. Well, this is a different conversation. So form is still there, but it's not the only feature. What really happens when you get to be an impressionist, you realize that you have multiple, you could have multiple fields to work in and from, and your emphasis might be different. I mean, his idea is that it is going to be different. And uh, because these guys actually care so much about the light, and of the light and the color of nature, they took a different approach. But I wanted to just show you this because the searching again is through the forms, 
these wonderful color movements, uh, just marvelous, marvelous stuff. And you can see the background going from this cooler thing to greener and up into here. Well, this is, I think, that same studio I pointed out before. No, maybe it's not. I, I can't, I'm not going to say any more about that. <laughs> Might not be. But, but just this is, this is a marvel of color movement. And honestly, I don't know of another way to do this. You have to find one version or another of color, uh, of color play in the sense of weaving, weaving color. That's all broken color is to me. Broken color doesn't have to show as such. It doesn't have to become its own aesthetic, but, but it's an incredibly useful tool uh, for, for accessing the truth of the color and light, but also of color movements and color fields. You know what I mean? So um, I'm probably, as again, I, I am overblowing this, but let me just take you over here to the Paxton again, because the question always comes up about going from a finish. I, when I was with Paxton Gamel, we looked at this in the museum, with, probably with Gamel, and all the broken color and the rather thickish paint. And I said, well, how in the heck did he get from, did he work from this to this, right? See this one here. And Gamel strongly implied, if he didn't actually say, that yes, he did. And I said, well, well how would he have done it? In fact, we had two paintings, one, both of which were the same shape and almost the same size and with, feature, with, with a figure in it. And one of them was smooth, and the other one was like this. And I said, well, did he, did, what did he do to get that smoothness afterwards? <laughs> And Gamble said, well, they had all sorts of dodges. They might have sanded. They might have done this. They might have done that. And I could never get myself around to the sanding part. <laughs> uh, I was you know, horrified of the idea of sanding holes in my canvas, among other things. But, uh, but if you do this with the, with the right amount of paint, and do, you can do this search with the broken color, and you just keep evolving it until you wind up here with this really... I wish I'd isolated just this head, but this really beautiful, smooth skinned thing, which is very much what you see in the Ang a few seconds ago. Except it's also included now, instead of having Ang's color uh, formula, it now has, um, which by the way isn't purely formula. I don't mean to say that because Ang is, Ang is bringing models in and using them for references, and he's, he's drawing forth beauties. Uh, he's also doing preliminary work in so many ways for these guys. That, and you have to read all about how he thinks about painting, but it's all there in the various things I send to you. But, uh, but in any case, you can see the smooth skin. It's no longer broken up like you'll see this passage of the arm is. It's no longer broken up like that. Um, and by the way, I laid this painting in. I did a copy of this for someone. I laid it in like this, and I finished it like the, to that finish, you know, to the finish it has. So it's entirely doable. Um, now, I'm showing you... Uh, a study uh, that I'm working on in a pastel. And the one on the right is the Chloe in the Sky, which you've seen on my website and that sort of thing. It's my daughter. Uh, but the, you can see the one on the right is a finished painting. But it started like the one you're seeing, the other one you're looking at, okay? It started just like that. And I'm showing you a close-up because I want you to look at the broken color and the way it can be used. And pastel is a little less forgiving because pastel has, you know, you can have a really large set and still not be able to find the color you're looking for, the value you want. but but you get used to that sort of thing, and you find ways of handling the marks. But I just wanted to show you this. You could see the search for the form, and, the, and, and for the form with the color movement happening through it is much more viable, much more available to you uh, when you work um, uh, with broken color. But again, you'll see on the right that there's no, there's no reason to assume that you must remain in a broken color world there's a certain unity required once you start pushing a thing into smoothness. Now you have to consider that the only parts now that can be broken would be the parts that actually have texture. Uh, like some of these, uh, this is supposed to be a star being born according to the Hubble telescope. And you guys can all sort of yell at me for using a photograph. What was I going to do? But, um, but to the extent that those things show as textural clouds and that sort of thing, the marks can be left. But uh, that's a, once you've decided though that her skin is going to be, go you're going to go ahead and push that to something more like the Yang type finish. But it all comes out of what you see in the other, uh, in the, in the close up there, uh, which is a study for something I'm working on at the moment, a uh, pastel study. So you can see the broken color still has some uses up here in the hat. That's some of the stuff that actually is suggested by the hat, um, etc. So Thank you, Zoran. I, I'm, I'm convinced I haven't precisely answered your question, but I took you on a tour through Broken Color. Uh, and uh, if you want to do something more precise, I'll throw it into something else, some, you know, if you, want to, if you want to clarify what you meant. And in the meantime, uh, do enjoy that and have a great, 
and have a great time messing with broken color and this, you know, just think of it as a search and think it, there's no end. If you really can see the magic of the world in front of you, there's, there's no end to the possibilities where that search will take you. So enjoy, Zoran, and thank you very much for your kind words. All right, guys, next time. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, I see that we've reached 1,000. I was trying to make some promises there. I'm still trying to think of something nice to do uh, as a to, to, to sort of uh, as a uh, marker for hitting 1,000 subscribers. But uh, do share, comment, and continue um, uh, with your own personal work. Uh, and I'm certainly hoping I'm of some service to you. All right, next time.